How do we perceive insects? Weird, strange, disgusting. They have so many legs, they move weird, and um, there are so many of them. They outnumber us when we put all mammals together. Uh, there are still a lot more of them in number of species, but also in number of individuals. There are also rare, rare examples of insects that we like. They live in every habitat we live in, even in worse habitats like feces or dead bodies. They use every food source we use, and sometimes even we are the food source. Um, but let's start with the insect everybody likes, and that is the honeybee. Honeybees produce honey, they fertilize our plants, and they sting only if threatened to be squeezed or the hive is threatened. So um, we even learn that as childs. And with Maya the bee, I want to explain you what the problem is that we learn that as childs, because when we make a child book, we make things that they are comparable to us. And there are a lot of problems with this picture of the bee. Probably some are quite obvious. We have, um, there are two legs missing. But the biggest problem is the face. So Maya has a nose. Maya doesn't need a nose, she has her antennae. And Maya has eyes with pupils. That is nothing a real bee has. The eyes are drawn here to have something like the Kindchenschema, the small child pattern. <laughs> Big eyes, something looks quite nice to us. But when we take this cat and put away the nose and put on antennae, it already looks quite <laughs> scary. And if we even put away uh, the pupils, then we have a really, really scary creature. <laughs> When you look closely to insects, they look even more disgusting or even more weird than uh, aliens from uh, some filmmakers made up. They are really, really strange creatures and it looks even more strange if you look to really magnified insects. Believe me, I saw a lot of them. Insects are really fascinating when you look at them, but how does all of that work? So we have here one beetle. That is a purified beetle that can sense forest fires above several kilometers. Like a suicide commando, he's flying directly into the forest fire, and he has a lot of infrared sensors on his, bodies, on his body, and he senses which tree is burned down already enough and cold enough that he can land there, and he'll put his eggs on this burned down tree. And so his offspring will hatch, and there will be no other uh, enemies around, because they are burned or they fled from the fire. Our other really strange example, which lives in a, some of these strange habitats, is this guy here. This is Necrophorus vespiloides. It's a burying beetle. This male of Necrophorus has antennae which are really fine-tuned to dead corpses. He is attracted by the corpses of small animals like dead mice. He will find uh, over a distance of several kilometers a dead mice in the forest and he will call the fem female to the dead body by the pheromone. And then they meet on the mice, they mate on the mice, and then they shave the mice. I'm not kidding. They uh, just cut off every single hair of that mice. They produce a mice mummy. And then that uh, then they bury that mouse King Tut and prepare a really sweet, nice crib for the maggots. Let's go back from this weird insects to the honeybee. <laughs> Probably um, then, yeah, I get a bigger, better point for them. So um, just imagine you were a bee. You would have six arms. You would have four wings. You could fly. That's already pretty awesome. You have an outer, uh, outer shell like an armor. You um, have complex eyes. You have no pupils. You can see in front and in the back and that all the time. You don't need to focus something with your pupils. That just would take too much time. You can taste with your feet. You can smell with your antennae that are outside of your body. With these antennae you also sense temperature, humidity, electromagnetic fields and you smell all the time. We as mammals only smell half of the time when we breathe in, and to locate something we have to move our head. Insects always have the antennae outside and they smell in 3D. 
They have a 3D image or something like that of their surrounding. When an order is coming from that side, it will first touch one antenna, then the other, so they know, know where the order source is coming from. And that is quite important for insects. They communicate a lot with orders. They tell each other, mm, I'm here, I found something interesting, or here's something dangerous, don't come here. They even cheat on each other by telling wrong messages with the orders. They um, talk to each other between different species, and they t uh, talk to each other even between kingdoms. Plants and insects talk with each other. So if some plant is attacked by aphids, the aphid Uh, the plant changes its order plan blend to attract insects that are predators of this aphid. But how do we know that? We can, okay, we can watch the behavior of insects, but with that we will not figure out every detail of that riddle. We can perform electroantennography. By that, you cut off insect antenna. Insects have also a really crazy way of feeling. That is also why they're superheroes. And um, when you cut off an antenna, the antenna will live on for several hours. You can mount the antenna between two electrodes. And what you then can record is the electric current the nerves of the antenna is producing. So you first have some kind of baseline. And when an order is occurring, you can measure that electric voltage. And that is already a detector that is extremely sensitive to a specific substance or can sense any substance the insect can sense. And it is even more sensitive than extremely sensitive analytic devices, which are extremely expensive also. When I started to do electroantennography, I was extremely frustrated because it didn't work out for three months. I drove every day with a bicycle to university, started my measurements, I got a baseline, I was happy, and then after 20 minutes, nothing worked, and I couldn't really figure it out. In the end, it were my fleece pullovers. The fleece pullovers produce a lot of electromagnetic fields, and I wasn't thinking about that because we don't feel that. I was driving with a bicycle to university, so I was always hot when I started and prepared my measurements, but then I put my fleece pullover on and I couldn't measure anything anymore. So why do insects sense electromagnetic fields and what do they do with that? If you were a bumblebee, I would, be, I would have to be honest and say, um, sorry, but you have a very unfortunate wing size body ratio. It takes a lot of energy for you to fly from one flower to another. And when I mean, it's a little bit more windy, you have to catch that flower and that flower is moving around. And it would be nice for you to know if the flower is already visited and if there is still nectar inside. So when a bumblebee is flying around, they get a high electric charge. And that charge is submitted to the flower when she's landing on the flower. So the next bumblebee that is coming senses that this flower is a little bit charged and that there is no nectar inside. So they, it uh, saves them a lot of energy. Electroantennographic measurements are a nice way to measure something, but the whole thing is also very, very sensitive to uh, outside influences. And that's why I stopped uh, electroantennography or yeah, I'm not doing that so much anymore and I also dislike to cut off the insect antenna, you can also train insects. And that is a little bit like Pavlov and his dogs. Um, but instead of um, showing them some meat, I give them sugar solution. So um, the bee on the top is a naive bee who would not react to a specific order that is not interesting for the bee, like an explosive or something like that. Then I combine that with uh, some sugar solution. I do that three times and the bee remembers that. If I repeat it on the next day, the bee is writing that on, in her long-term memory and 80% of the bees will react like the bee in slide C. But uh, how can I use that as sensor? There is uh, a device. In this device, which looks a little bit like a handheld hoover, are 36 bees. The bees are restrained in these small uh, things and they lick on a sensor. So if these bees are trained on explosives, only half of the bees in this device will be trained. So if there are explosives around, half of the bees will lick and you will get an alarm. If there is a flower volatile to which all bees would react, then all bees are licking and the device will give no alarm. 
That is also the theory about uh, how to train insects, but in practice it also looked quite different for me. I trained a lot of bees and it takes a long time and it's really, really tiring to not touch the antenna to glue everything with sugar solution or something like that. And on one day I started really early and my food switch got broken where I normally get the odor delivered. And so I pressed with my, my hand a button to get the odor delivered and trained a lot of bees. In the evening, I was still training bees. I was a little bit slowly and didn't press the button directly and the bee in front of me started to lick. I thought, hmm, that is weird. So I put all the other 30 bees in front of me and put my arm up and all of them started to lick. <laughs> At that day, I didn't train the bees to the order. I trained them to the blue part of my shirt, to my sleeve. So, if you train insects, you have really to be careful that these intelligent small bees don't get everything. There are even more not, uh, cheaper devices to use trained insects. There's a device which looks like a small cup. There's a small hole on the bottom and a fan on the top, which is always sucking the air inside, and a webcam is also inside of this cup. On the bottom of this cup, there are some small parasitic wasps. They are just one millimeter big. And it's really easy to train them. You just add the order to the sugar solution. Um, you give them and then they will always react to that sugar solution. In that case, they have trained the wasps to explosive of landmines. And if uh, this order of the explosive is appearing, the, bees will go to the, uh, the wasp will go to the hole and it will get dark in that cup. If you use one of these cups and put it on the AC car, you can just drive it above a minefield and see when, okay, here the, duck, uh, the cup got dark, here will be a mine, I should avoid that area and, um, or probably dig out the mine. This is much cheaper than uh, a sniffer dog and if something goes wrong, an AC car with 20 wasps will go blown up and not a mammal. And you can train insects to any other thing they can perceive. What I did recently was I trained bees on drugs. And I made a quite sensitive drug sensor with that. We uh, remember the two insects I told you in the beginning of the talk, uh, the burying beetle and the pyrophile beetle. They would be awesome forest fire and uh, corpses detector. It would be really nice to use them. But the problem is, um, they are really hard to rear. They have a really strange ecology and it would be nice to have them as trained insects, but that doesn't work. So people try, uh, some scientists try to find out which enzymes are behind that smelling. And it's a really, really complicated business to figure all of the steps out and there up to now is no artificial sensor based on that insects. But people are dealing, uh, working on that and we will see how, how the future will look like. <laughs> the next time you see uh, some bee bumping into a glass plane in your uh, flat, don't think uh, that dumb thing. Remember what a superhero that bee is. And like every superhero, it has a weakness. It cannot see glass planes. Thank you. Thank you.